My name is Nazanin. I am from, uh, I'm an activist of the uh, Communist Party of Iran, Marxist Leninist Maoist. Um, and uh, well, tonight we are going to talk about a little bit about the history of our party and also how it is related to the divisions in the international movement of uh, communism. Uh, well, as uh, it was introduced, our party's name is CPI-MLM, but this name actually doesn't explain fully our theory and political line, uh, because now we are followers of Bob Avakian and new communism and uh, new synthesis of communism. Um, and this is a summation of the experience of the communist revolution and socialist states and uh, drawing from many diverse spheres of human uh, activity and thought and it represents a further uh, qualitative development in the science of communism that is embodied in the fundamental orientation method and approach and the core elements of the new synthesis. So uh, new communism represents a um, continuation of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and also a break from uh, unscientific elements, which uh, ran counter to the fundamental scientific body of the communist theory. Uh, while advancing it in important aspects such as internationalism, epistemology, a strategic approach to revolution, and overall, Bob Avakian has put the whole science of communism on a higher level, and this is an ongoing work uh, being carried out by him. Therefore, um, his work is a leap in communism as a science, and our party, after many years of consideration and internal struggle, have adapted this uh, new communism as today's dividing line between scientific revolutionary communism and all uh, other varieties of left. So, uh, as it was said in the even description as well, our party is established in 2001, but it's a continuation of Union of Communists of Iran formed in 1976. And uh, this was also a continuation of Organization of Revolutionary Communists formed in 1970, which I will run through its history soon. And as I um, said, uh, we are working to make revolution in Iran, overthrow Islamic Republic, <coughs> and build a new socialist uh, republic in Iran. And we have also written a draft constitution that indicates the features of this future society. Uh, I hope that we will have time tonight to speak about that also, but uh, before that, let's talk a bit on the history of our party with the international struggles and uh, communist movement. So our party originated in the 60s global uh, movements and revolutions uh, which were raging around the world against capitalist imperialist system and the reactionary ruling states in different countries. It was a time that anti-imperialist and national liberation movements were going on in different countries and of what today we call Global South, but also in uh, countries of Global North were imbued uh, with very important struggles. For example, anti-Vietnam War and Black Civil Rights Movement in the United States or women's struggle were going on in Europe and United States and there were so much student movements you are aware of in Europe which mainly constituted by, uh, by students and women. Uh, but <clears throat> what was the main source of revolutionary inspiration in the 60s for changing the world for the oppressed and exploited was existence of uh, socialist China. And what was going on in China itself uh, was part of the 60s global upsurge. Socialist China was going through a revolution within revolution, which was named by Maoist leaders and Mao as the Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution. So <clears throat> our original uh, founders were part of the youth 
who became revolutionary communists under the influence of Mao's call to found a new communist movement against bourgeois leaders of the Soviet Union, who had restored capitalism in the first socialist country. They challenged two main political trends in the opposition forces in Iran. Uh, I hope that these names are not very new to you so you don't get confused. Uh, one part was the Tudeh party, which uh, was a reformist pro-Soviet party, and the other one was National Front or Jephemeli. Jephemeli uh, had been formed by Dr. Mossadegh, uh, and you know that uh, he was overthrown by CIA in 1953. So. Uh, these leaders uh, broke with these two trends and put forward a revolutionary communist line to make revolution in Iran. The Organization of Revolutionary Communists was founded in uh, 1970 by a group of young communists and based itself on Marxism-Leninism, Mao Zedong taught. And the paper name was The Communists. The, and based uh, itself on um, the Marxist and Lenin's and Maoism. The main leader was uh, Siamak Zaim, who was a student in Bay Area, California, and had been influenced by the Student for Democratic Society and the Black Movement in the United States, and later by the Revolutionary Union in the US. Siamak and his uh, comrades got involved in taking active part in leading the famous World Confederation of Iranian Students, especially the U.S. branch, and organized the student movement against the Shah regime, as well as imperialism and support of all just struggles in the world. Later, another revolutionary group called the Palestine Group united with the organization to form Union of Communists, of Iran in 1976. The Palestine group consisted of a group of revolutionary students of Tehran University who had gone to Palestinian camps to be trained as revolutionary guerrillas, but did not have a clear revolutionary communist theory or line. They were influenced and transformed and uh, their main leader was Hossein Riahi. Later, other groups and circles from different parts of Iran joined the Union of Communists of Iran, especially from Kurdistan, Khuzestan, the petroleum uh, state, and some of the Caspian Sea in North uh, cities. Revolutionary leaders such as uh, Pirut Mohammadi, who led formation of Pishmargas of Toilers organization in Kurdistan, so these three people, Siamak, Hossein, and Pirud, were key leaders in armed uh, struggle against Islamic Republic of Iran in Amul, which stated in summer of 1981, and came to its height on 25 January 1982, when its revolutionary army, Sarbedaran, uh, seized the Caspian city of uh, Amul, and was bitterly defeated after two days. Uh, after the fall of the Shah regime, most of the revolutionary students who uh, had been led and trained by the Union of Communists of Iran went back to Iran. So uh, this organization quickly established itself in different corners of the country and became a countrywide organization. The union initiated a women's organization called Militant Women's Organization, which was a prominent force in uh, March 8, 1979. Uh, the women's rebellion against Khomeini's call for forced Islamic hijab. Um, and also initiated a countrywide student organization and took active part in projects, uh, workers syndicates in Abadan, Union of Soviets of Gilan workers, and many other factories and university councils. It organized an armed group in Kurdistan, Pishmarga of Toilers organization, which is very different from Kumala. 
Kumala was later in 1982 formed a party uh, in Kurdistan called Communist Party of Iran. So after the uh, defeat of Amol uh, uprising, the union suffered a countrywide crackdown by the Islamic Republic military and security forces. National leaders and uh, regional leaders were arrested and most were tortured and executed. Pirut was killed in the midst of leading Amol uprising and the founders of UCI, Siamak and Hussein, were captured and uh, later tried uh, in an uh, infamous uh, Evin prison and executed in Amol. The trial of union leaders uh, is the most famous political trial in the lifetime of Islamic Republic. It was filmed and was broadcasted to send a message. But it has become one of the most serious documentation which can uh, indict the Islamic Republic as war criminal as well as a brutal uh, killer of the political prisoners. Khomeini's testament warns his successors not to show any mercy to Union of Communists of Iran. The remaining, for, uh, remaining forces of uh, Union regrouped in areas of Kurdistan, uh, Kurdistan of Iraq, which was run by the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan of Jalal Talibani, and many others went into exile in Europe. A process of regrouping and reorganization and summation was initiated by totally new leadership because whole leadership had been lost in battles. This process involved uh, an all-sided review of the line and policies of the UCI and its theoretical understanding. And UCI was renamed after that UCI Sarbedara. This process rethinking and uh, reorganization uh, coincided with regrouping of Maoist parties and organization in an internationalist world organization called the Revolutionary Internationalist Movement, or RIM. RIM was formed in 1948, um, sorry, 1984. RIM was formed on the basis of a declaration which itself consisted of major lines of demarcation against those forces who had sided with the capitalist China after 1976, capitalist coup in China. This process, uh, uh, process of reconstruction of UCI Sarbadaran was brought to a conclusion by a formation of our party, CPI MLM, in 2001. Rethinking and reviewing the line of the international communist movement continued in RIM and UCI was an integral part of it. RIM came to an end after 25 years and the basis of it was division of MLM into two by uh, ruptures that Bob Avakian had brought forth. As I said in the beginning, our party adhered to new communism. Here I want to um, look back uh, on UCI analysis of the nature of Islamic Republic of Iran. After 1979, uh, fall of the regime of Shah and counter-revolutionary seizure of power by the Islamic pow uh, forces, UCI made the wrong analysis of the nature of the new regime. Its analysis, in short, was that the new regime under Khomeini was reactionary in terms of internal relations in the country and anti-imperialist in its international relations. So UCI criticized this wrong line and made a rupture with it in 1980, um, one year after the revolution, or even less than one year, and UCI called to rise up and overthrow the Islamic regime. To the party and uh, Fedai Aksariyat group, which now called themselves uh, Left Party of Iran, 
uh, had united completely with the Islamic Republic and when Sarbadaran armed struggle was initiated, these two groups called uh, on their supporters to unite with the Islamic Republic of Iran and crush UCI. So they committed uh, horrendous crimes in alliance with Islamic Republic of Iran. UCI Sarvedaran and later CPI MLM made a clearer and more correct analysis, um, analysis of the nature of the Islamic Republic regime and called the nature of its contradiction with US and Western imperialists as a reactionary contradiction, which never had any progressive or any real anti-imperialist nature. In fact, Islamic Republic has integrated Iran much deeper than the Shah regime into the workings of world capitalist imperialist system as a subordinate dependent country. But this analysis was not getting into why there was a rise of Islamic fundamentalism in Iran and Middle East. And what is the actual dynamics of Islamic fundamentalism, imperialism, contradiction? Bob Avakian analyzes this contradiction as a contradiction between the reactionary strata within countries dominated by imperialism and the reactionary ruling strata in the imperialist countries. They both are feeding from the same capitalist uh, system and the horrors that its working creates for the masses of people. <coughs> Avakian emphasizes that if you side with any of them, you will end up strengthening both, even though the imperialists have committed much bigger crimes, but that does not change the dynamics. So this analysis uh, is a very important guideline in today's world, and especially in the Middle East and North Africa, for uh, polarizing the political scene in a way <coughs> which is uh, favorable for making revolution and leading the masses in Iran and Middle East to consciously fight for a world for the whole humanity. So our party firmly based itself on neo-communism brought forth by Bob Avakian because it actually is the second breakthrough after Marxism was founded by Marx in collaboration with Engels. Lenin and Mao applied Marxism to make initial communist revolutions. Obviously, socialism built in China was much more advanced than transformation carried out in Russia. The world necess um, necessitates and urgently calls for a new wave of communist revolutions to start. Without that, we will see more horrendous Gaza-type genocide to happen, horrible destruction of environment, danger of nuclear war between two imperialist blocks of uh, United States plus NATO on the one side and China and Russia imperialist on the other side. These two blocks of capitalist imperialists are now carrying out reactionary proxy war in Ukraine in the midst of Europe, and tomorrow, same kind of proxy can flare up in South China Sea. We need a new wave of communist revolutions and establishing new socialist republics. What do we mean by new? This is a very important and crucial thing to understand. And Bob Avakian has concretely defined this new future socialist republic in the draft constitution of the new socialist republic in North America. And our party have applied its universal content to Iran in uh, its draft for a new socialist republic in Iran. This is the most crucial task which all of us from every corner of the world must share. And at the same time, it's, uh, it's very late and humanity is greatly threatened by vicious forces of reactionaries and imperialists all over the world, as we can see it from colonial carnage of Israel in Gaza. So I 
uh, ask you to take a look in our uh, constitution and also Baba Vakian work. Uh, we have brought the books here, but also you can go to the website cpimlm.org or to revcon.us where you can access um, all these documents and read and uh, think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we'd like to open the round a little bit and get into a discussion so everyone is invited to say what you think. It's always hard to start. <laughs> <Who'd make laughs> first? Yeah, then I would make the start. Yeah. Um, you said that it's needed to build an international revolutionary movement. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to ask how the internationalism you proclaim translates organizationally and mm -hmm. practically. Like, mm -hmm. what can you do from another country if you're a part of your organization mm -hmm. to, I don't know, support the struggle in Iran for socialism or for world socialism? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question because actually internationalism is one of the very important core elements of uh, communist movement in general and in new communism as well. And uh, well, we think that um, even when we make a revolution in a particular country like Iran uh, for new socialist um, state, uh, it would not be only for Iran. We will make this revolution for the whole world. And we look at this from now like this. We are not looking to emancipate only Iranians. We are looking to emancipate whole humanity. And it will translate itself to organization, to our policies, to our constitution, uh, what kind of goals we have, what kind of movement we built. So one of our tasks now is to build a movement for revolution everywhere. But uh, of course, more uh, concentrated now in United States because of uh, Revcoms and in Iran because CPI MLM, but also everywhere in Europe, everywhere. We need to build a movement for revolution. And what does this mean? what kind of uh, guidelines it should have, what kind of goals it should have. It should be clear in mind that what are we fighting for, uh, what are our red lines, so are we siding with imperialists in any form or not? Are we clear that um, even the um, smaller imperialist states are still imperialist and part of this world? Are we uh, understanding that reactionary forces and fundamentalists, Islamic fundamentalists in Middle East and North Africa are also not for the emancipation of humanity, even though they are uh, standing uh, against uh, so-called imperialist Wests? So first of all, the most important thing is to have a clear mind and political line about uh, how do we understand the world, how do we see it as a whole system that should be uh, overthrown. And um, after that, of course, we can make a lot of uh, kind of initiatives like uh, programs or campaigns for many different things. For example, uh, we have been formulating in Iran that we have seven um, important issues that we have to work on. Women's issues, national oppression, uh, environmental issue, um, the theocracy itself that the um, religion and the state is uh, came to one, uh, the poverty and uh, unemployment. Uh, so all of these are the things that we have to build revolution, uh, a movement for revolution around it. And these things uh, we can find everywhere in the world, like the racism that we are facing also here in Europe, uh, the movement that need to be built against the um, 
these um, anti-immigration policies that they are putting forward. Um, women issue is important everywhere in the world. We can see how they are attacking women, abortion rights, um, and uh, it takes like different forms or uh, like the a movement that was raised for um, against rape and rape culture. So all of these are very important and should be embraced with us but also to put a revolutionary line in front of them that where are these all of these movements and resistance are going what are we going to build um, what kind of society we are fighting for and how we can really overthrow the state and gain a new power build a new power the new structure so these are part of this uh, movement for revolution uh, that is uh, needed everywhere in uh, every country and uh, many times I was asked that how they uh, we can in Europe that how we can help for example woman life freedom in Iran how we can help revolution in Iran and I was always saying that you should uh, overthrow your estate it will help Iran <laughs> you should make your revolution you should make your um, movement for revolution here and it will help Iran don't think in a very uh, direct and mechanical way that we should uh, give money to Iran or we should do something very directly even though that's also great if you want to work with us and help with that but think about it very internationally this is a system and anywhere we can uh, attack it it will help uh, everywhere so that is the internationalism the basis of internationalism is the basis of this system the capitalist imperialist system that is connecting all of us everywhere in the world because it is making a network of people who are working <laughs> in a, a chain of production we we are all having same future in under this system environmental crisis is not just for iran it's not just for europe it's not just for this and that country or nuclear war or all of the danger that we are facing with so um there is no way to even uh, think about your own emancipation without thinking about the whole humanity emancipation. <laughs> <laughs> and in how far would you consider yourself like a theoretical or a pre-political organization? Because you're saying that first you need to think of a program and then you can act? Mm, well, no, actually I didn't mean that if that is translated like that, I'm sorry. Because, no, I don't mean that it's a phase-by-phase -phase thing, that we should first think and then act, like in 10 years or 20 years, because we don't have really time, right? The climate crisis, at least, doesn't give much, much time. So, uh, at the same time, we are learning and we are working on the theory, we have to act, we have to build this movement for revolution. And this is something has been started many years ago, but we have to join it and try to complete this. Um, so there are already um, organizations, for example, if I stay in the United States, there are revolution clubs, there are um, bookstores that are having different kind of um, events and they are organizing, for example, in universities, they are giving a speech, they are um, trying to make protests for, for example, abortion or um, different things. So there are so many things that are uh, under um, to be done. <laughs> there are so many things, but uh, still um, at the same time, it's important to not just think that, um, okay, now we are getting a gun and we are going to uh, just overthrow the state and then we will think what kind of society we will build. No, we have to know from now that what we are fighting for and we have to have a clear mind <coughs> while we are fighting for it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> 
Yeah, just yeah, just talk. Just, <laughs> Everyone yeah. can say. Yeah, I want to add uh, something about that. You know, uh, what kind of society we are fighting for? Uh, okay, that was uh, a uh, very important issue when uh, the Union of Communists of Iran initiated the armed struggle to overthrow the Islamic Republic. And uh, uh, actually, you know, there were a lot of documents and discussions about that, how we are going to transform uh, the um, economy of the society. And, and uh, always one of the important, you know, uh, investigations and research and, uh, you know, uh, analysis uh, was what is the socioeconomic structure of the society that uh, what are the problems that uh, you have to rupture with after seizure of power so that you open the way for building uh, socialism? And what is socialism, you know? And uh, so uh, UCI had an analysis that Iran is a semi-feudal, semi-colonial country under the regime of the Shah. And by that, it meant that, you know, Iran has become a, uh, you know, capitalism has developed in Iran mainly through export of capital by imperialism, you know, and very much adhered to Lenin's analysis, which was, consider which was considered an, ad a, an addition and a breakthrough on the basis of Marxist capital, you know, that capitalism has entered into a phase which is uh, accumulating all over the world and connecting everybody together and uh, but this doesn't mean that you know these european or north american uh, in, uh, capitalist countries when they go to countries of the south or uh, asia uh, africa latin america they make those countries like themselves no you know, why, you know, uh, uh, they export capital and capitalism develops in those countries too. But still, you know, like a, a, a very important division between two types of countries happen, which makes all of those countries, you know, uh, uh, subsumed into the workings of this world capitalism, which all of these are explained by Lenin, that how it happens, you know. And uh, so, these countries, while they have their own internal, you know, like structures, but this whole internal structure of oppression and exploitation is, you know, part of, you know, a, a world system which is working. So, understanding this kind of relation uh, was very important to come to, un to understand that this uh, Islamic forces who have seized power in Iran, okay, they are not actually different, you know, as separate from this whole fabric, you know, just, you know, a regime, a, a form of dependent regime of the Shah has changed to another form of dependent regime, you know, and Islamic Republic is, is, is functioning uh, in terms of its uh, economic you know, uh, structure exactly like the regime of the Shah, you know, the same way, you know, in the international division of labor, Iran is a producer of petroleum, you know, and this, you know, pet, uh, export of capital goes through this uh, petroleum industry and organizes the whole society uh, and the exploitation in the whole society as a dependent country of this whole capitalist imperialist system. And it's not just, you know, a trade relation, for example, between, say, Germany and Iran. No, you know, I mean, these imperialist uh, capitals, either through finances or direct, you know, investment, etc., they are part and parcel of the structure, you know, class structure, social structure inside Iran. So, uh, when it is said that the Islamic Republic is anti-imperialist, you know, it's in a way separating, detaching, you know, imperialism from its 
foundation, capitalist foundation. And, uh, you know, when UCI criticized that understanding of making uh, Khomeini anti-imperialist just because, you know, he's, he, he has a lot of problems with US imperialism, you, uh, UCI criticized that line and said that, look, you know, imperialism is not some, uh, you know, uh, some kind of uh, horrible, you know, like force outside the frontiers of Iran. Imperialism is here, you know, in the fabric, you know, of the economy, in the fabric of the society. And, and these Islamic fundamentalists, why, you know, huffing and puffing against, you know, imperialists, but they have never ruptured, you know, from this whole system. And this whole system continues to subjugate Iran and continues, you know, like to make uh, the, the workers, peasants, you know, uh, oppressed nationalities, the same structures which were put in place by British Empire, you know, during the Reza Shah, you know, like uh, the, the grandfather, the father of the previous regime of the Shah, you know, the Pahlavi regime, still it is functioning exactly like before you know the only thing which happened was that you know a, a western type modern ruling strata gave, gave its place to islamic forces and these islamic forces themselves you know were part of the regime of the shah actually you know the documentations show that how these islamic forces helped cia in making a coup in 1953 against Mossadegh regime. Why there was that kind of collaboration? Because the Western um, capitalist imperialist powers at that time were engaged into a Cold War. And they, they were enforcing you know, these Islamic forces against the communist forces and against the nationalist secular forces. But later on, when they opened the way for them, they came back and you know, beat the hands of the, their previous allies. So it is important to understand this dynamic between these forces and these Western imperialist powers. Why it is important? Because it is one of the most important dynamics in the world, you know, which is uh, really confusing the people, you know, it's uh, making the people, you know, in, uh, that as though their alternative either is this one or this one, you know? And, and we could see uh, in the Jina uprising, you know, a woman uh, life freedom, freedom uprising, a lot of people had, were dreaming about that, you know, against this Islamic regime and this theocracy, that uh, could we have a little bit of democracy and a little bit of, you know, well, Rich, uh, uh, richness of the West, West, you know, could they export a little bit of that to us? You know, something. This is an. This is also an illusion. You know, this is also thinking that, as though these imperialist powers, like the U.S. or European imperialist powers, what they are distributing in the world or they want to distribute is democracy. That's not true. You know, what they have been distributing in the world was the kind of political and social and economic structures which would enforce their, you know, supremacy. So it is very important not to detach. I mean, this is important for us. I am talking about, you know, like how we have summed it up. It is extremely important not to detach imperialism from its capitalist base. And uh, there have been, you know, forces in the Middle East since, you know, after Second World War and recently that always they detach these two from each other and this prevents, you know, the, the people to see, a, 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 to, to be able to imagine, you know, a, another world, you know, socialism which is uh, which uh, fundamentally means that to do away with uh, capitalism and also there is this tendency that since you know these uh, countries of the global south they are not as advanced economically as much as you know the countries in europe or us 
So socialism is out of question. You know, first they have to, you know, be be advanced, you know, from by outside outside forces so that they would be capable of socialism, which is not true. And actually, you know, the historical historical example of China proves that. Yeah, just say something. <laughs> yeah, uh, as you mentioned, Lenin and imperialism. Mm -hmm. Then it said imperialism is a stage, mm -hmm. and he said it's the highest stage of capitalism, mm -hmm. and that signified a necessity to him, the necessity for world revolution, mm -hmm. and he deemed it possible in 1917, 1918. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you also say I, I read a paper from your party. Um, that you that a revolutionary war was needed to um, mm. solve the problems of Iran um, and Lenin also said like this revolutionary war was necessary mm -hmm. but on a world scale and he could rely on the second international which was an international party with like millions uh, of organized workers around the world and as we today don't find something like this, it just raises the question, how can we still, 100 years later, after the failure of this project of world revolution, still hope for it? And um, yeah, how is this more than just like wishful, mm -hmm. yeah, like, like a really good idea, but mm -hmm. yeah. Cannot happen. Good idea, but cannot happen. Yeah. It seems like it. I mean, would you say that the Chinese revolution uh, was successful, like analyzing China nowadays? Because you say the example that a revolution is possible is shown in China. I said that, uh, you know, I was uh, countering this point of view that countries who are, you know, uh, not capitalistically very advanced cannot make social revolution. Which I said that, well, an example, even Russia was not very much advanced. Okay? Mm -hmm. And China, definitely, you know, 80% of the population were peasants. But they did succeed, you know, to uh, make social revolution and by going for socialism in the midst of it to deal with the backwardness too, you know, all of those feudalism, et cetera, et cetera, you know, that, you know, one of the biggest uh, distribution of wealth in the history of humanity was done uh, during the land revolution in China, which succeeded to uproot feudalism and open the, the way, you know, for socialist construction in China, and the, the the it's true that you know like it didn't last much. It lasted you know like 27 years of revolution, construction, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, uh, but uh, to us, you know, making these kind of big you know changes in the world and in human conditions, it is going to have defeats. And defeats are natural part of it, you know. And and those uh, we consider, you know, uh, whatever amount of socialism was built in Russia or later in China, which we think was much more advanced. Okay, we consider them initial steps. But even though they were initial steps but still they reveal a lot about the possibilities that humanity have in order to emancipate itself from all kinds of exploitation, either feudal or capitalist exploitations, you know. And actually, you know, one of the services of capitalism has been that it has connected all of the humanity into one body, you know, and internationalism that she explained you know, it's coming from a material basis. But when, even though we are connected, you know, but we are separated. So we are obliged to make revolutions, you know, in different countries. But we have to make those revolutions in different countries, not with a, with a you know, idea that 
I, I am gonna make it here, and I am gonna go all the way here by myself. It's not gonna happen, you know? It can only be like a base area when you succeed in one place. And the internationalism is that to look at your revolution as a base area, you know? And that's also realistic, because already everybody is like, you know, intertwined in, into each other. And we don't have, we cannot uh, emancipate ourselves separately, you know? I remember a uh, scene that uh, in one of the very important novels uh, about the black, you know, slaves escaping in, in southern US, you know, they used to uh, tie blacks together uh, as prisoners, you know, by rope, okay? and then. These 40 of these blacks, they escape, but they are roped together, okay? And they cannot uh, escape without coordinating with each other, you know? We are just like that, you know? We have to escape from the clutches of this system, but we also have to coordinate. And we are separate, but we are uh, tied to each other, and we have to coordinate in terms of, you know, our goal, first of all, you know, as she said, you know, what is really socialism? We, may, we have made social, socialist revolutions, we have built, you know, primary socialist countries, so we have to solve the lessons of that, you know? And those steps, they're initial steps, frankly. <laughs> and they have to be summed up, they had a lot of errors, you know, they imitated a lot of things of the capitalism, you know, you can identify and see, these are the things that Bonavé can have done. The, there were errors of theory, understanding, for example, Marx's theory of inevitableism. It is inevitable that we are gonna go to communism. No, it's not inevitable. Okay, and we have seen that it is not inevitable. You know, uh, for example, you know, the whole humanity can, can be wiped out by environmental destruction or nuclear war. So there is no inevitableism. It is something which is possible. It is not guaranteed. It is uh, good <laughs> and it is needed. So we have to fight for it. We but we have to understand that, you know, by, crit by knowing that how capitalism functions, you have to know how, you know, its counter is socialism. How? How you have to really break with all kinds of workings of this capitalism, uh, starting from, you know, the, the cr uh, core of it, which is commodity relations, as Marx said, you know? I mean, enough is enough, you know? <laughs> we are, our relations are antagonized through commodity relations. Different nations are fighting with each other as a result of workings of the commodity relations. Environment is destroyed as a result of commodity relations. So why should we tolerate this? If I can bring back my question. Yeah. Um, because you said, uh, we should not tolerate this, and you should. Mm -hmm. And you said we we can't coordinate ourselves. We can't like find one common direction, because I think this is really tied to the problem I raised mm -hmm. that Lenin really trusted in this second international, mm -hmm. and he thought this was the only way to have this international party to, um, yeah, to to not tolerate this, to make it really. A, a real possibility and to really um, make it happen and also to coordinate, to coordinate all the different struggles. So how can we proceed without such an organization? <clears throat> well, um, in regarding your, your question, uh, I wanted to also add something to what my comrade said that um, why we think it's possible now, uh, why uh, it's shown it failed once at least. Um, so we should look that um, what is the material basis for that? Is there any material basis or is that or our wish only? If that's our wish then let's forget it because we're, 
people were wishing for such a just and nice world from the slavery time and they didn't have the material basis to make it. But why we say now it is possible? Because the system has been creating such a relations that can, um, like the production, all the technology, all the knowledge that we have been created, all the humanity were creating all of this, now came to the point that it's possible to live without classes, without the division, uh, that we have in society without uh, hunger, without poverty, without all of this. So there is a material basis. But then we should see what is the um, obstacles there, why we cannot just do it. It's very good for everyone, why we don't agree <laughs> and just go do it. Because it's not that easy, because there are so many obstacles in reality in the system we are facing, which is very brutal, ruling class, but it's not just brutality, it is producing thoughts. It is giving you framework how to think about things. It is giving you um, the ground for uh, acting even against it. It is trying to canalize you to a certain point, a certain way that would you can, yeah, you can resist and you can object and you can complain, but don't overthrow me because you have done it once and it didn't work. <laughs> so all of this is part of the working of the system. And uh, that's why it's very important that the revolution should happen in your mind first, as Marx said, that the whole structures should be ruined in your thinking and you should think outside the framework of the system. You should be conscious about how this is possible. So this is also again related to inevitabilism that uh, was raised here because it doesn't mean that if now we are all revolutionary so we can make it for sure, it's guaranteed. No, it's not. But without this subjective force to act on the objective reality and change it, it will never happen. So there is only a chance, there is no guarantee, there is only a chance that we can have and uh, change the objective reality by this conscious form, force. And uh, I want to urge you to go and read this um, article. This is the rare time when revolution become possible by Bob Avakian, because here he is actually analyzing the world situation and particularly in the United States that why, what, like, what exactly happened in society, what changes happened after uh, Second World War and after Cold War and so many decades of imperialism working, United States in top, what kind of things have happened in the world that became to this point now, came to this point that uh, we are facing a society torn apart in very different directions from women uh, question to the, like you see the oppressed nations and imperialist countries, you see how the, not just the um, people, but also the ruling class are dividing and torn apart because they cannot agree on how to even continue this system. Like, Democratic Party and Republican Party. Some part of the ruling class are trying to uh, save the system by fascism. We can see it everywhere in the Europe and also United States. And some part of it is urging that we should keep the democracy, bourgeois democracy is still in power. And they cannot agree on how, how to go on. And this will just torn apart all the society, all the layers of different uh, people and groups of people. And this will have impacts on how the system is working. So when revolution becomes more possible, when there is such a crisis in the system, so we cannot make revolution at any time that we want, even though you think that I am really ready, let's do it. No, we need a crisis in the system that the ruling class cannot control people as it used to. And controlling just doesn't mean, again, by just uh, by uh, oppression and by suppression, but by even controlling the thoughts. If they cannot control people, they are in crisis. Then second, we need revolutionary people. Where are they now? 
but obviously we don't have so many revolutionary people. Those people who don't accept to live normal way that the system is uh, defining for them. So they should be built. And then third, we need a conscious force, a vanguard, uh, who is the solid core of the revolution, a party, someone who can show the way, has a strategy, um, a strategic approach to revolution, what to do, next step, how to gain power, when we gain the power, how do we make a new socialist state, how do we go all the way to communism, where there is no state, no class, no oppression. If there is such a force, and if there are such a revolutionary people, and if there is such a crisis in society, then we have a chance, and we have to use it. That's the whole point. The point is not that it's for sure we can do it. No, we have to build all of this, and they, they, they are related to each other. The more we have the vanguard force, the more we can have the revolutionary people. The more we have revolutionary people, the more crisis the system will have objectively because they cannot control. And all of this would integrate and create a situation that revolution becomes possible everywhere in the world, including the United States as the top imperialist. Yeah, what you're saying makes me think of like the new left of the 60s mm -hmm as well because there was that idea right to have those different radical movements all over the world and everyone is trying to either liberate their <coughs> own country mm -hmm. in an anti-imperialist way and anti-imperialism in the western and more dominant countries mm -hmm. would be resistance against the own government mm -hmm. um, and then it was also very similar to like Stalinist policy mm. that also declared that every country may find its own way to socialism, mm. which then also led to discussions about whether the national bourgeoisie is useful or not. Mm. And this is something the Tudor party also split over in the 50s. Mm. Um, and what you're saying sounds to me a lot like this moment that you imagine that every country like builds its own revolutionary movement and you hope that if you're lucky everyone will make it at about the same time to overthrow the government but what happens if not i mean like why did the russian revolution fail why did the chinese revolution fail? Why did these countries become what they became mm -hmm. today? Mm -hmm. And like pointing towards the question mm -hmm. of him, like, isn't there a need to coordinate internationally as well? And what do what do we learn, actually, from the experience of the new left and the failure of every country mm -hmm. doing its own mm -hmm. movement? Yeah. What do you mean by new left? Can you uh, you mean the Frankfurt School and uh, I mean, to Syrians, those people? I mean, mean like the new left student movements, for example, the SES in the US, but also here in Germany there was an okay. SDS. Mm -hmm. And then also what is interesting is that like Maoist mm -hmm. organizations and even party building projects also arose from that. Like mm -hmm. for example, we in Germany had the DKP. DKP Mail or DKP? DKP, German Communist Party. I know, DKP, which was pro-Soviet, but you had also DKP Mail, no? It, it was a Maoist party that was founded in 68. DKP Mail. Yes. Okay, like, I, I mean them, and they were also influenced, like you said, it's not that different from Iran, right? They were right. influenced by Mao and the Chinese revolution. Mm. But somehow right now they are like the weird guys, like mm. the old weird guys, <laughs> and you really don't want to have anything to do with them. Uh -huh. And maybe we want to talk to them <laughs> because we think they're interesting, but why aren't they appealing to the working class? Mm. Why, why can't they build a revolutionary movement? What do we learn from that experience already made on the left? You know, actually, it's uh, interesting, uh, and it applies to everywhere, that uh, 
uh, even the best of you know old uh, communism, like Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, we call that the best of the old. That is self divided into two, and uh, necessarily it divided into two. It was going to divide into two, and it was very important that you know to to uh, consciously uh, divide it on a, uh, uh, where the cookie should crumble, <laughs> not you know I mean where it should divide, and uh, this is why the work of Baba Vakian is important because. You know, when you look at the, he, when he looks at the experience of two socialist countries, as well as the theories, you know, that they had, because they were guided by theories, lines, etc., etc., you see a lot of things which are not correct, and you have to sum it up. And this happens in any science, you know, you cannot have the physics of like 100 years ago, okay? I mean, things develop. Human thinking in every sphere develops and when it develops it sees you know the wrong things wrong elements in the previous one and we have those weird you know people that you are saying that they they attach the old things you know a hundred percent like a religion and they, they their approach to a science is unscientific and sometimes anti-scientific and if, you, if your approach to science of communism is scientific, you sh it sh it's natural that it has things wrong, that you have to look back and rectify them, both in theory and the practice. And why those you know, socialist countries fail, that all have been analyzed. You know, I mean, first it was like studying metaphysics. You know, as though that when we called ourselves socialists, it's finished, you know, and the whole thing, whole classes, you know, the birthmarks of the previous society is, vanishes by declaring it. No, it doesn't vanish. Mao Zedong said that no. Even when you uh, have established socialist power, still, you know, the divisions of the past, you know, they have their birthmarks, you know, and the socialist soil itself is problematic because still it is surrounded by the capitalist world, still it is marked by the birthmarks, you know, of divisions of the past. So this soil necessarily will give rise, you know, to forces who want restoration of capitalism. So that's what happened. He saw it, how it happened in Soviet Union, and Mao declared that I can see that it can happen in China. That was important. He said, I can see it can happen in China. And the whole cultural revolution that has been smeared so badly, you know, wanted to prevent that by arousing the people from the bottom, you know, to see the difference between capitalism and socialism. And Mo asked that where is the bourgeoisie in socialist country? It is not, you know, like petty owner. He said that bourgeoisie is right in the Communist Party. That was very important advance, and that made, you know, that's why a lot of people who wanted to be communist, they were absorbed to Mao Zedong in the 60s, you know. That's how new communist movement was produced. And because he had solved the riddle in thought, you know, what is socialism, and in practice, you know, I mean, his practice of trying to prevent restoration of capitalism in China through, uh, you know, cultural revolution didn't succeed. So we cannot say that, you know, I mean, we have to question why it didn't succeed, you know, why all of those millions of people who were thrown into, you know, like political life, finally, when this new bourgeoisie came to seize power, the masses couldn't rise up themselves, you know, so it's a problem. So these problems has to be confronted in order to come up with a better understanding of, you know, how the new <coughs> social society should be, 
uh, looked at and should be preserved and should be, you know, like taken further as furthest as possible. Like for example, you know, under under uh, uh, Russian socialism and Chinese socialism, there was a state ideology. Okay, that's wrong. You know, I mean, how can you have a state, you know? Uh, to say that I have official ideology of Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, while the millions of masses are not Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, you know? So you cannot make a state ideology, that's wrong. And also, you know, I mean, this society has to percolate through a lot of, you know, uh, uh, discussion, opposition, dissent, etc., etc. That liveliness should be kept and should not be snuffed out, you know, just because this socialist country is surrounded, you know? I mean, it's true it is surrounded. But, you know, all of those forces who are not, you know, uh, adhering to uh, the, uh, even to socialism, they can have a lot of contribution, you know? They can have a lot of contribution. So how your, how the socialist society is going to, how do you say, um, how do you say, to create this energy and keep it, you know, in, in the service of just taking the society deeper and deeper towards, you know, a society which all of the divisions are vanishing as well as confronting the world and, you know, inspiring the world. And you are saying that, okay, there should be, you know, an international organization Yes, yeah, sure, you know, international, first international, second, third, you know, these are these very important organizations. Actually, when we built Real Revolution Internationalist Movement, we built it, we built it in 1984 as a, uh, how do you say, uh, not, uh, as a embryonic international. We built it as an embryonic international, okay? So, yes, we, we are going to need international. Actually, you know, we summed up that Mao was wrong not to have called for an international. You know, Mao Zedong said that, uh, you know, third international under Stalin was not good because he was interfering too much in the, you know, revolutions of here and there. But Mao was wrong because it, the, the, the wrong thing was not that they interfered. You know, the wrong thing was that they had a wrong line, you know. They told uh, Chinese revolution that they have to unite with national bourgeoisie. They should give the power to national bourgeoisie because China is, you know, 80% uh, peasants. You know, Mao said, no, you know, I mean, why should we give? We can seize the power and solve all of these problems under the road to socialism. So later, uh, Stalin had to make a self criticism and Mao criticized him for looking very mechanically at social society, for all of those, uh, you know, suppressions that still we as communists have to pay for it, you know? Because the, he was looking at the opposition and dissent in a mechanical way. Okay, this society, you know, uh, by declaring, you know, socialist has not, uh, how do you say, uh, put uh, aside all of the divisions. These divisions are going to produce, you know, uh, dissatisfaction, dissent, opposition, etc., etc. So you cannot say that you know all of these po people who are opposing me, they are the agents, you know, of the Germans' enemy, etc. So yes, we need international, obviously. But the thing is that you know revolution is not going to happen, <laughs> you know, in one time everywhere. It is going to happen in waves. <coughs> and international is important because. The people who haven't seized power, they have to overlook the socialist countries, whether they are doing the correct thing or not. You know, it doesn't matter. You can be a, you know, a, a, a communist party, revolution communist party in uh, Djibouti. <coughs> okay, they have to have their say on how China, uh, Mao Zedong, <coughs> whether Mao Zedong's line on international relations is correct or not. They have to have their say. And how are they going to do that? By having an international. So international is not that, you know, there will be one big, you know, uh, father or mother party telling everybody else, you know, what to do. Uh, 
that's that's the wrong line and that happened during third international and second international you know Kowski was doing that uh, so uh, we have a new concept a totally different concept of how this internationalism should be built uh, and how it should be coordinated etc by new communism Could you maybe tell us a bit about your practical work in Iran, or I don't know, in general, the practical work of your party, I think, which would be quite interesting. <coughs> Our party, uh, because of the um, Iran, Iranian government and how they are uh, controlling everything, so our party is very much a hidden underground party and has been always operating during these years like that. So we don't have a um, organization or an office that you go like here that you can go and uh, know what is uh, going to be done. But our um, supporters or our members in Iran, they do an underground work to uh, advertise the party's line and to um, basically, the most important thing is, again, political line and theory for us. So that's the thing that we have to give it to people on important issues, not just abstract theory, but about everything that is happening in Iran, like in woman life freedom. What is it? Why it's happening? What is the problem in this uprising, like the framework of people, uh, why they are thinking uh, for uh, democracy and bourgeois democracy is the best thing they want and uh, why um, they are limited to the opposition groups that are known like the son of Shah, uh, previous regime or uh, all uh, kind of different Mujahideen or I don't know how much you know the different opposition groups that are known to people why they think that they have to choose between these why they don't think another way is possible so th these are the things that we are always trying to put uh, out the line on our magazine that is called Atash or it means fire so uh, by that magazine uh, actually we organize that what what are the most important issues uh, what are what is the correct line and uh, to connect with people and to transform their thinking so uh, the most important thing for us in our strategy for revolution is to fight the power and transform the people for revolution so at the same time that we are against Islamic Republic and we are exposing their um, brutal um, behavior on people and the oppressions and all of this and we are explaining why they are so because it's not because they have a bad heart or blah blah it's a system so what's wrong with that system that has to do all this so at the same time that we are fighting this regime and telling people why this is so we have to transform people as well because they are trapped in this way of thinking and how they are acting even to get rid of the system they are acting inside the system so we have to transform them as well that's why the importance of the magazine and the political line on our website or different social medias or face to face as much as we can because uh, it's underground so this is the most important thing we are trying to do to transform people and then get organized but even for um, really organizing, uh, like because you know we talk about uh, war, revolutionary war, so we need an army for it. But we cannot build our army now because, of course, the first step you take, you will be suppressed. By but how are you going to build this army without building the army? So how do you are you putting the uh, baby steps there? So then you will grow when the time comes uh, and you can make an army through the political work you, you have been doing for years and decades. So while you are transforming people, you have this strategic approach that even though they are not 
um, like physically organized in an office or doing this and that, by the, but they are getting transformed for the revolution and ready to um, act when we need to get to uh, really arm the struggle or uh, start an initiative against the power. So this is basically what we are doing in Iran and also outside, of course, we have more uh, possibility to be active because we don't have on we are not under such a suppression here yet <laughs> because of, well let's see how fascism will also here uh, suppress us but here we can have more uh, freedom uh, relatively to do political work to again um, tell people uh, organize them because as we said in our history also um, the students outside the country were the initial part of this party. So again, the students here abroad are very important for us to be part of this revolution. They, um, they are not just foreigners or um, as we saw also last year that in uprising, how they came, how they were, even though they were not political, active, but again, they were feeling that they should do something. So they were present in the protests and all of that. So there is a huge potential also outside to work and organize people. And of course we have more possibility to organize. So here we will have events, different kind of like forms of organization, events, protests, um, writing, reading groups together, conferences, debates, all of this that we can do. To, but the whole point is that are we transforming them for revolution or not? You know, one of the things that now is extremely important, not just for Iran, but in Iran is very important, is the question of political prisoners. Mm -hmm actually free political prisoners now and uh, organized fights inside and abroad around that slogan is extremely important in bringing the people to resist this criminal uh, acts of the Islamic Republic and that is uh, and, and that is being led that kind of activity is being led by our party with the line of that in the how in the midst of suppression by the enemy okay you should always be able to turn it against itself meaning that you know uh, the people should get more outraged when the uh, regime comes after the best sons and daughters of the people, you know, and that is very important. That all the time, you know, when the suppression comes, you go uh, and mobilize the people to resist it. Uh, I think that maybe uh, you one good example is when there was uh, news that the uh, security forces of the regime have surrounded the Sharif University. This was like in the beginning months of, uh, you know, Gina uprising. And uh, the families, not only the families, the neighborhoods, you know, and, and uh, whoever could get information that that is happening, they went and they surrounded the security forces who had surrounded the students the students who had risen up in order to support the Gina uprising, to protest, etc., etc., And that was great, you know. This is exactly, you know, like a prototype or a, an example of how uh, all the time, you know, like the people should be mobilized in order to fight the crimes of the system. But at the same time, all the time, there should be vanguard forces <laughs> among the people to tell them that, you know, we are getting organized for a revolution. And it is not that our, our thing is not just resist, resist, resist. Resist plus resist plus resist is not going to equal to revolution. Okay?
but in the midst of, but this resistance is necessary in order to open the gates you know for the possibilities of revolution and most of all you know like to think about revolution and why it is necessary and how it is possible and get organized for it so this is something that should go on all the time and this uh, uh, free political prisoners now internationally also is very important for our party and for all of the revolutionaries in Iran you know and actually now a very intense struggle is going on by the political prisoners themselves actually you know as one of the you know, uh, prisoners who uh, was swapped, you know, uh, I think his name was Anushe. He, he said, you know, I mean, he, he really was not a very, you know, political person, but he became political in prison. And then he came out and said that, you know, like the best people are in prisons of Iran, which is true. And these are all the people, you know, who have been leading, you know, the masses to resist, to struggle, uh, older revolutionaries, younger generation revolutionaries, among, from amongst the students, from amongst the workers, you know, oppressed nationalities, they are all in prison. They should be liberated. And this takes, uh, you know, a very internationalist and mass, you know, uh, uh, movement in order to do that. And, uh, this regime should be called out on, on this question and defeated, and this defeat would, would, would open a lot of possibilities for revolution in Iran. And this, is, this can be a model for the whole world, because everywhere we are facing that. I am sure that everywhere, you know, the in, in environmentalist movement, you know, uh, women for abortion rights, you know, uh, black people, etc. You know, they they face this kind of suppression, and uh, so this needs to become a model. And uh, we are trying, you know, in Iran to how do you say to make an example out of that. I can also uh, suggest this website, International Emergency Campaign to Free Iran's Political Prisoner Now. So this campaign is working internationally. You can check it out. Um, that exactly they are working in the issue that my comrade said. Um, yeah, I wanted to say something about the point as well that you say it's like a new communism, and um, you have to integrate a learning experience. And we in Platypus are also hoping for a left that is able to learn from its past failures but we're also skeptical about like the more recent history of the left because it was also that the new left and also like internationally but in Iran thought that they would transform Marxism right and like turn it into something new or maybe add like aspects of um, Islam mm -hmm. with, for example, the thinker Shariati, mm -hmm. and they were greatly supported from leftists in Europe as well. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, Foucault is maybe the most mm -hmm. extreme example, mm -hmm. but it was also like <laughs> less extreme students in the US and in Germany who encouraged like the Iranian left to um, experiment maybe with also the possibilities that may be inhabited in religion mm -hmm. and what maybe looked like opening a way to transform Iran in 79 turned out to be an absolute catastrophe exactly. so this makes us a little bit more skeptical about like the optimism to say like we will destroy a regime and this will open up a new way and like and how far is that a repetition, like what you're saying, mm -hmm. of this past situation? And how can we make this repetition productive? How, what can we learn from it to not happen again? Mm -hmm. And like, is there maybe something from historical Marxism that we can learn of and something that tasks us? For example, this question of like the need to organize mm -hmm. instead of us just always trying to transform it and rethink it and maybe 
add something new. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, I am familiar with the uh, wave of the new left uh, who tried to uh, sum up, you know, the, the, the failures in Soviet Union by adding some uh, things to Marxism, you know, just addition. We had Foucaultism, Foucault, Michel Foucault, I mean. Not Foucaultism. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Or Althusserism in France, you know, and the uh, Frankfurt School, uh, obviously from all kinds of thinkings of people, you can learn some things, you know, but all of them really did the service because they made a mishmash and eclectic, you know, and uh, uh, you know, Mar uh, Marxism is not how you talk about Marxism. Marxism is a science, and it's science of critic of, you know, the prison system that we are living under, you know, and then uh, the, the transformations which happen in this objective, you know, system that we are dealing with, it needs analysis, you know. Again, what you add has to, you know, correspond to what the reality is. Not that, you know, my, what is my imaginations of, of things, okay? Or what is my narrative? What is your narrative, you know? It has to be able to, you know, show that it is reflecting the reality and the dynamics of the reality. And by understanding that structure and dynamics of reality, you find a way that how it can be changed. And Michel Foucault was a disaster in terms of, you know, like... Uh, how it approached Khomeini regime and said that, okay, all of the left has failed, so maybe now these ayatollahs are going to show the way forward for us. I mean, imagine somebody saying that, you know, after, you know, that humanity has passed, you know, has, has put, uh, is behind its religiosity and has, uh, understood that how to look at the world, you know, like scientifically, objectively, etc. And the whole postmodernism, which was, you know, really financed in the academia in order to, you know, wash away communism. And, yeah, and they, they were successful, you know, they were successful. And, and this praise of religiosity was part of postmodernism. And, and that is very important, you know, to, to make a uh, analysis to understand, etc. But the most important thing is that you know we cannot just imagine things out of our heads. You know there is a reality that we are dealing with, and this uh, there is a uh, method and approach how to understand this reality, just like all the scientists do in terms of biology and physics, etc. A lot of this. A new left was saying that no, you know, like this science of society is different because it has, you know, spirituality in it. It, it has, which is, you know, all of those things we have summed up in our party and especially, you know, by Baba Vekian, which uh, I, all of these things have been dissected and I think that, you know, we cannot discuss everything here. And it should be, you can ref make, you know, I can make references, you can yourself go search, and you can also invite them, you know, to come and talk, you know, the right. other followers of new, new communism. Yeah. But to what you said, didn't like this impulse to integrate religion, mm -hmm. like this figure Shariati was, for example, um, very inspirational for the Mujahideen e Kalk. Yeah. Kalk? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it. Kalk. <laughs> um, who were inspired by Fanon mm -hmm. and also f by Mao yeah. and felt encouraged to like supplement Marxism with Islam and like an idea of there being a peaceful ancient Islamic society that needs to be reconstituted by the revolution, right? So sorry, it's you like you said that he was supported by Mao? Inspired by Inspired. Mao. Who? Shari Sh Shariati? Never. Or like the Mujahideen Khalk? No, Khalk? Never. <laughs> They call themselves Marxists, but they, they are and They did, but they never said that they are inspired by Mao or even Lenin, etc. They called, they didn't call themselves Marxists. Mujahideen 
had a split, okay? Majority they had a split because some of their leaders, okay, they uh, ruptured from religion, Islam, and they became Marxists under the influence of the leftists. So, Mujahideen al they never said, or Shariati, they never said that they had been inspired by Marxism. That okay. was accusation of Khomeini against them. Khomeini said that they say that they are Muslim, but they, in fact, they are Islamic Marxists. That was accusation of the Islamic, of Khomeini against them. Okay, but Fanon also referred to Marxism, right? Mm -hmm. But, yeah, but what you would you would say he was inspired by Fanon uh, and Shariati. the the Mujahideen al <coughs> uh, I don't know if Mujahideen al was was uh, inspired by Fanon, but Shariati was inspired by uh, anti-colonialist thinkers. Yeah. Right, but like the point I was trying to make is referencing it to what you said that we need to think of something new and also make the revolution in our heads. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to point out, wasn't it precisely this point of the new left mm -hmm. to see in the supplementation with religion this something new and something different mm -hmm. that can maybe be tried out of the experience that like traditional Marxism and everything you're upholding right now didn't work out mm -hmm. and led to failed revolutions, mm -hmm. Stalinism. Yeah. You know, not everything new is correct and not everything new is wrong. Not every new is the same. I mean, of course, they were also to make, trying to make something new by putting Islam beside Marxism or there are so many other new things that are happening, right? Like identity politics, um, intersectionality, feminism, Marxism, this and that, right? They are all new. But are they really corresponding to reality? I, are they really scientific? Are they uh, summing up the whole um, experience we had correctly or not? That's the whole uh, thing that we can uh, divide new things based on that. And you would say no, they're like not correct or adequate for reality? Um, no, not, um, not that you cannot learn anything from that. I'm not saying that you can learn something from different things like feminism we learned a lot from that in women's struggle because communist movement had this, this problem that didn't pay enough attention to women's issues and that was a big help uh, a big work that was done by feminists but but by putting feminism beside marxism you don't solve the problem like that but you should go and see what was the problem in understanding um, the patriarchy understanding the class divided society and what is the relation of this patriarchy and class divided society so when you don't understand that the reality so you get uh, mixed up in different solutions that are not really even solving that problem like, uh, we will make a revolution, tomorrow women's problem will be solved. No. Or, we don't need a revolution. We can reform and we can get women's uh, emancipation inside the system. Again, no. So what, what is the correct um, answer to that? That's the thing. That That's we, the question. <laughs> yeah, so we would say that we need a revolution for that, but that's not going to be solved right after revolution. All uh, women's problems uh, and issue is the thing that will continue until the point we get to communism because it is very much rooted in all relations, human relations, in everything in the society, in all levels. It is so much rooted in all kind of um, like um, relation of uh, production in um, family, nuclear family, and all the things that we had in history. So uh, it will be a major um, unsolved contradiction, we would say, that would continue in the socialist transition period until we get to communism. And it's a force, actually, to go further. 
you should count on it as a force to go, not uh, as a problem, but as a potential uh, energy to push you forward. Because until you don't solve women's issue, you don't get to uh, free uh, without class society. So um, all of the issue, now we went a bit inside the women's issue, but um, all of the other questions are as well, that people were trying to answer them, like new left uh, that my comrade mentioned, the front, but all of them were trying to answer what was wrong, why we failed, what can we do better? But not all the answers are right answers. But how do we know? Like, what gives us the mm -hmm. the assurance? Of course, you can't have guarantees, but like, what makes you more and, sure about and a certain? Said the proof of the pudding is in the eating. Mm -hmm. So you can only prove theory by practice. And without any real practice, without any I don't know, clash with the powers that be, how can we know what's, what's right or what's mm. wrong? Because I would say, like, departing from this mm. situation right now, it, you, you can say the women's feminism issues or the environmental issues just by themselves are as effective mm. and as desirable and as adequate to reality or maybe even more adequate than Marxism. They are part of Marxism. Uh, to understand the reality is part of Marxism, like uh, environmental question. There is a lot of contention that there is environment is being destroyed or not. Okay, there, even, even those who say that there's nothing wrong with the environment, they come up with junk science. Okay, they, they come up with a lot of, you know, uh, proofs, etc. You know that it's not happening. But how do the the scientists uh, are proving that you know environment is being destroyed? You know they 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 have criteria, they have the tools to prove it. You know and they have the measurements. You know they they look at things. You know in, in terms of the history of things, they compare all of those things. So in Marxism, it's like that too. The Marxism, when we are talking about new, it doesn't mean that, you know, you, uh, you uh, how do you say, you uh, don't continue what had been proven before. Marx worked on capital for 10 years, right? He proved that how this, is, this, this phenomenon, this system is working. And the first thing that, you know, uh, why at the beginning, you know, he started to work on that because he wanted to know that where does this, you know, like poverty, you know, being accumulated on the one side and, you know, wealth on the other side, this misery, miserable society, etc. Where is it coming from? Okay, he wanted to understand that, right? And then he worked on it. And he made it understood that this is not something which is coming from the, you know, uh, that some capitalists who are really bad, you know, like uh, uh, horrible people genetically. No, it's a system which makes them horrible. Okay, so he proved this, and then okay, th this was pro uh, this this became a fact like Darwin's evolution. Okay, evolution became a fact, you know, I mean, how, how are you going to uh, say that, you know, it was disproven, okay? <laughs> yes, Darwin's explanation of evolution had some wrong things in it, gradualism, etc. that later on, Stephen Jay Gould came and said that, you know, look, you know, there were leaps in how, you know, these species developed. In Marx, uh, 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 after Marx, Lenin came and said that, look, you know, uh, some things uh, doesn't correspond, <laughs> okay? And what made him to think that, you know, some things doesn't correspond? It was when the, the second international, you know, he was, he mentioned, all of them went bankrupt. All of the, the most important communist parties of the world, you know, here in Germany. They, they became accomplice to their bourgeoisie in the First World War. So, you know, he was like, uh, 
you know, he was uh, into a lot of trouble th thinking that what is happening, you know, I mean, where, where does it come from? And he had to go and study, you know, again, uh, both capital and the capitalism at that time itself, which he came back, you know, with this understanding that there has been a transformation in capitalism, which is a continuation of the previous capitalism plus, okay, the same thing you said, you know, the uh, last stage of capitalism, which it became imperialism, meaning that, you know, it just, this capital went around the world, you know, and then the metropoles became the hub of, you know, the, the plunder, you know, of the workers of the world. And what happened is that they started uh, to uh, give some of the, uh, some bribes to the working class here to make it, you know, calm, because the home country of the capital has to stay calm. It, it doesn't, it should be prevented from going to revolution. And so when he analyzed this capitalist imperialist stage, he came back and said that, look, this, this dynamics of capitalism has also changed the class and social, you know, configuration of the society. You know, what has happened is that now we have uh, workers aristocracy. We have labor aristocracy. And this labor aristocracy is the social base of the betrayal of the social democratic parties who are now in power, right? So that's the analysis Lenin made. Lenin didn't just say now we are, you know, capitalism, imperialism is the last stage of capitalism. No, he said that it has made changes in the political scene, in the social scene, in the class scene of the society. And the most important conclusion, which the left in the imperialist countries always failed to understand, because if, if you don't understand it, you are going to be in the final analysis chauvinist imperialist chauvinist. You should understand this thing. Okay? I have one last yes. question. Um, um, is there, I had a look in the book, mm -hmm. and is there any idea how leadership um, um, how leadership um, leadership often leads in errors to correctly, and how we can avoid this. Is there an idea how we can um, avoid avoid what? that it leadership goes into errors to correctly of the leaders, like authoritarianism? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, exactly. There is last two pages. Last two pages. <laughs> <laughs> wow, <laughs> love it. <laughs> um, no, but really, the last chapter is about leadership and it will explain why we need leadership, but why we need a different kind of leadership, not yes. a top down, but we need centralization and decentralization. Why we need that. Uh, not because we are more democrats, but because we are more communist. We need a society without class, without a state. How are we going to make it? We need every person to be transformed to a, a strategic commander, to a leader, to a thinker, to get responsibility of the society. So how we are going to build them from, again, today until the socialist society and from there also go on. Actually, it's a very good question, and it's a, it has been a big problem in history. So that is one part of um, the, how new communism is trying to deal with these problems in communist movement and in the whole world. And that's something that is actually answered very. And it's in decentral, or it's a system of central and decentral positions. And not fixed, personal, personally fixed states, it's fluid. <laughs> uh, you mean the state itself, the socialist state? How it no, no, she means that um, uh, 
this uh, says that uh, it is not fixed in one person, it is fluid. Yes. Okay, so when you say that centralized and decentralized, <coughs> what do you mean? Mm -hmm. uh, decentralization is in the political line. And of course, many people can get it, <coughs> the political line, and be the central part of it. But also, uh, decentralization means that many people who have who have gotten this line can um, decide things and can act in different regions and in different areas based on their understanding, which is in line with the strategic approach, not completely something uh, out of the um, story, but. Uh, something that is in relation with the others, how they are moving forward, but it's not coming all from one point, top down, this kind of thing. Even though we, why we need that at all, you know, why we need a person like Baba Vekian himself to even <coughs> um, explain this. Because we have, in reality, we have division of labor, we have the intellectuals, and we have some people who have to work with their hands and they cannot grow their intellectual potentials, even though they have it, but they cannot because of this system. So we have to get rid of the system. We have to get rid of these divisions that everyone can have and use this potential to become an intellectual, to use the intellectual uh, potentials to be responsible for the society. So one of the... Mm, most beautiful thing I think in my mind in this new constitution for a new socialist republic is that the most basic right of people in this society is to become the um, caretakers of the society themselves and to be responsible. It's their right to be in the in leading the society, which we don't talk about it in democracies and bourgeois. Uh, societies, but there they have this right, and they we should fight for that to be happen in reality. So they would really have a chance to say uh, their opinions, to transform themselves, to get the political line, to change the society, and all of them to go toward the final goal to a society without any divisions, without exploitation, without oppression. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You wanted to do a last thing? Yeah, I think I have a last question, but I would also prioritize someone who hasn't asked as much already as I have. Um, we should wrap it up pretty soon, so use your last chance. Okay. I, I mean, afterwards, I think we can still go sure. to the pub or something. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just um, I would just like to hear a bit more about um, what new communism means. What is you said something like Lenin and Mao only um, applied. applied Marxism. Mm -hmm. So they are like two big steps, if I mm -hmm. got this correctly. And the first is Marx and Engels, and the second is Bob and mm -hmm. So can you say something about the second big step? Mm -hmm. The point is that, of course, they've, they've made also bigger steps, uh, Lenin and Mao, as we talked through this session. But uh, what was the critical thing in Marxism, Leninism, Maoism, and all the communist movement is that there were uh, some unscientific uh, elements in this body that was in uh, against the scientific body of the Marxism, Leninism, uh, Maoism. So these elements were actually uh, changing the whole uh, understanding of Marxism to something unscientific. So when we say Bob made the second leap was by uh, understanding these elements, getting them out of this scientific uh, body and also advancing the this scientific body to more um, to the higher level based based on what are the uh, changes that have happened happened in the world and what we are learning from all other thinkers for example 
in epistemology like necessity and freedom how do we understand it we have more dialectic understanding of things right now because our understanding of um, emergence and system has changed by <coughs> physics by all other um, spheres of science not just by Marxism but by other uh, spheres we understand that how things are more dialectic and there there is not a um, direct um, relation between necessity and freedom and whatever we act on we will get the same result no there is so much complexity in the system for example it's just one part of this but this epistemology generally and the method and approach generally in new communism have become more scientific and it's a con more consistent uh, consistent in being scientific for example, many people think that uh, Marxism is an ideology or communism is an ideology. You are an ideologic person, like a religious person, blah, blah, blah. Of course, there is ideology in it as well. But the whole point of it is that even that ideology is based on the science. And how we are uh, even seeing this uh, relation between ideology and science. And um, this whole thing made uh, the, this epistemology more scientific and understanding that communism is not just about a moral stance, but it's about solving a fundamental contradiction in our era, which is a, a fundamental a contradiction of capitalism and imperialism. So, um, I think that's uh, the core element of new communism when we think about it, but it has many aspects that we can get into in uh, uh, next uh, discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to present your organization, your party, and as said, we would really love to go to a pub and mm -hmm. talk in a less formal setting, and everyone here is invited, so thank you. Bye. Yes. Thanks. yes. <laughs> Thanks for organizing this, it was really nice to...